have the great pleasure <laughs> of introducing Laura Brolleri. <laughs> well pronounced. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Um, yeah, so my name is Laura Brulleri. I actually just graduated from the select graduate. So I'm a select graduate. I'm a little bit nervous, so bear with me, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, so I have been the, mm, the, uh, the community leader in, um, in Lisbon for the past year, and I'm a community representative since two years now, since I joined the Inno Energy Program. But today I'm here in front of you as a young woman who's going to take her first steps into the magic world of the energy industry. So why am, why am I here speaking about gender equality in the energy sector? Well, I had the luck to work with an amazing team. <laughs> Some of my colleagues are here, like Marcus, Agatha. Um, I've been working on gender equality in the energy sector for the past year in collaboration with the UN initiative called Sustainable Energy for All. And I had the chance to travel to Africa and to study companies' policies regarding gender equality, women empowerment in the energy sector. And today, I'd like to share with you some of the findings of this research and try to give you a little bit of my point of view about responsibilities in, this, um, in, in regard of gender equality in the energy sector. But let's start with an easy question. What percent of the world population is female? Please answer me. <laughs> Actually, no, it's, it's around about 50%. This is the, the data from last year. Let's get it a little bit more difficult. What percent of the global energy sector workforce is actually female? More or less, yeah, 22.1%. Now, the question is not, this is a lot, this is a little. The question is, what do these numbers mean to us? What do 22.1 percent, what, what does this mean to me that I have to start working in the energy sector knowing that I'm represented by our 20 percent of people? What do this number mean for all the men working in the energy sector right now? So we'll try to answer this question. So this is the agenda. This is more or less what we're going to treat in this presentation. Um, I would like to give you a little bit of introduction about what gender equality actually means, what women empowerment means, because many times there is a little bit of confusion between these two terms. And then we're gonna look at the numbers, what the, what the numbers to tell us. Um, and we're gonna try to answer two main questions. The first one is, can businesses be gender equality sponsors? Can entrepreneurship be vector of gender equality? And last, I'd like to discuss with you about responsibilities. Who's responsible for gender equality in our sector? Is, is a responsibility of businesses? Is responsibility of entrepreneurs? Is our own responsibility? I'd like to know your answers to these questions too. So this is um, the more recognized definition of gender equality. So gender equality is firstly not a women issue. It's everyone issue. It's not only about men, it's, it's not only about women. Women and men will never be exactly the same. No one wants that, right? But gender equality refers to the same, the fact that women and men should have the same rights, the same opportunities, and the same, well, let's say, duties, right? So, considering this um, definition, what does women empowerment mean? Women empowerment, we can say, is a cornerstone towards gender equality. It's the first step that will bring women from being here and men being here to something like this. No one wants this. We all want this. Okay? So, women empowerment, we can say, is the first step towards gender equality. And gender equality will bring us to sustainable development. Now, I know that most of you here in this room always think about sustainable development looking at the environment. And this is right, of course. But we should all remember that sustainable development will not be achieved if we don't consider society and economy. Now, why am I saying this? Because when we speak about sustainable development, we should think about the sustainable development goals. They come to help us when we speak about sustainable development, especially because sustainable development indeed refers to those three main pillars. 
Specifically, sustainable development goal number five refers to women empowerment towards gender equality, and sustainable development goal number seven, <laughs> let's say, tries, strive to reach sustainable energy for all, for everyone by 2040. So, when we speak about sustainable development, we can actually say that mainstreaming women participation in critical sectors, such as the energy one, could help us to reach sustainable development. However, still, in the energy sector, we are behind in terms of gender equality and women representation. And despite increased efforts, the International Energy Agency still ex expects us to have more than 5 billion, 500 billion people with no access to modern energy services. So I would like you to go through this presentation with this in mind, because I believe that sustainable energy systems and women empowerment can come together and define a viable pathway towards sustainable development. Now, I'm not the only one saying this, although I'm proud to say this, but I'm not the only one. Many studies in the literature and many companies have already looked into what the participation of women do uh, to organizations and to the communities where women are involved. Ernest & Young, for example, in 2015, found that companies with higher female representation in their boards, executive boards in this case, show 4% higher return on equity. Actually, yeah, 4% higher return on equity. And these studies uh, studied more than 200 companies between 2005 and 2011. McKinsey also looked into female representation and gender equality within many companies and found out that companies having one, uh, actually more than three women within their, comp within their executive boards have re superior results on nine dimensions of organizational performance, among which there is direction, coordination, external orientation, leadership, and innovation. And I think we can all agree that among this nine dimension, among these five especially, in the energy sector, we really need those ones. McKinsey also found <laughs> in, a, in a very, let's say, surprising report that the world economy could expand 11% in this case, considering the, the global GDP of 2015, by $12 trillion by enhancing gender equality at a rapid pace. Specifically in this report, um, McKinsey also says that um, the, the EU, so the European GDP and the US GDP could grow respe respectively 13% and 9% if gender equality could grow at a rapid pace. But what is even more surprising is that the report says that um, at least 15 emerging markets in the developing world could grow their per capita GDP by 20%. Now, how is our own sector doing? How is the uh, sustainable energy sector doing right now? Well, we're not doing that bad. In the renewable energy sector, 35% of the workforce is composed by women. And we're actually the, the, the sector that has the greater representation in the overall energy sector. So we might not be those many, but doing pretty good. Now, there are other studies that looked more specifically into the technical stuff within companies. This study from 2016 found that among technical staff, 6% are estimated to be women. Of this 6%, 4 4% are in decision-making position and less than 1% are in top management positions. Still, we are not those many, but we're doing pretty fine. However, um, Ernest and Young found that still, between 2013 and 2016, only 1% progress has been achieved. With this in mind, we know that to achieve not, not equality, so not 50%, but to reach 40% female representation in the boards of the main 200 power and utility companies in the world, it will take 72 years. And I, I mean, I hope I'll be there at that time, but I'd like to see this happen before. Now, let's step into the first question that we will try to address. Can businesses be gender equality sponsors? To answer this, me and my 
seven, eight colleagues, we did a, a study on 85 energy companies, among which there are the leaders of the sector and some companies that we have identified as um, influencers. So I refer to influencers to, do, to those companies that already have some gender equality policies within their organization. How did we do it? So we researched, we read, we read again, and we read a lot. Um, and we tried, we actually categorized their internal policies related to women empowerment and, and, and gender equality. What we found was somehow surprising. So of the 85 companies that we analyzed, only 39% had at least one policy in place that was addressing women empowerment or gender equality. 39% of 85 is, if I'm not wrong, 34. And this specifically is the breakthrough of our analysis. So of all the policies that we read, we categorized them in, in six, yeah, six different uh, categories. As you see, WE stands for women empowerment. And what we found is that m the policies mainly re are differentiated between women empowerment policies for women in the in management position and women empowerment policies that look at the whole workforce. For what concerns CSR, so corporate social responsibility, uh, we found that most policies were looking at women and the community, uh, educational programs, and HR stands for human resources. So those uh, policies that usually look at parental programs, parental leave, and diversity workforce. And diversity workforce is mainly like, okay, we want this amount of people uh, this amount of female in our workforce. I would like to underline this name because this is the utility of Reykjavik and this is the only company among those 85 that actually reached gender equality, the only one. This doesn't mean that this company have has all the six different categories within their organization, but this company has 51% of women in their management, the only one. All the others company didn't even reach something close to this. One thing that though all these companies have in common is the interest for revenues and profits. So these graphs show you the percentage of companies, depending on their revenue, yearly revenues, that have um, policies. So as saying that, all the companies having more than $100 billion revenue per year, all of them had policies in place for gender equality or women empowerment. Well, those companies that have less than $4 billion per year as revenue, only 27% of them has at least one policy in place. Now, there is no mathematical Low, low for this, but what we found is that it seems that companies that have more revenues also have policies in place. This might be that, uh, this might come from the fact that policies and programs for gender equality and women representation most of the time needs money to be run, right? right? Something, a similar result was also found uh, for the number of work or workforce of the companies, so, such as saying that the largest companies in terms of number of employees also had more likely policies in place for gender equality and women empowerment. However, the main takeaway of our analysis focuses on this fact, the fact that there is a general lack of accessible data and information about gender equality and women empowerment policies in organizations. This saying that our analysis could only be based on publicly available information and we didn't find as many information as we thought we could have found. Also, there is a general misinformation about this topic and this is why I think it's really important to share the knowledge about this topic. Now, we saw that businesses might be good sponsors for gender equality, but what about entrepreneurship? Can entrepreneurship help women to re reach gender equality? To do this, we went to Africa with the help of a few number of people. <laughs> um, and especially we went to East Africa for two weeks, where me and my team, we interviewed 154 entrepreneurs, of which 70% were women. What we interviewed them about was about demographics, so 
where, what were they from, um, what did they do, especially we focus our attention on their entrepreneurial activity within the sustainable energy sector, their time use, and on mentoring and coaching. What we found was surprising, both, both positively and negatively. So this is a big takeaway. So all the 154 entrepreneurs that we interviewed, so all of the 154 people we interviewed were entrepreneurs. And about 70% of them were women. But what we found is that even though all the women were entrepreneurs and pretty affirm entrepreneurs, still the majority of them didn't, was not recognized within their household at the head of the household or in inequality with the men. This was very surprising to us. Another thing that I like to underline here is that more or less the same number of male and female said that they were the head of the house and most of the time they were um, husband and wife and that's nice. <laughs> Something that was surprising to us too is that um, the people that we interviewed that, that received formal coaching reported a 312% more revenues on a yearly basis, no matter the gender. So this made us understand that it doesn't matter if you wear pink or blue, if you're good at doing what you do and you're trained to do that, you're, you're gonna reach your goal. And this might be clear to us here today, but this is not the case in East Africa, especially. Another very interesting result was this one. Self-efficacy is defined as people believes about their capabilities to produce designated levels of performance that exercise influence over events that affect their life. Translated for us engineers, it means if you're good at doing what you do, you know it, basically. And what we found is that both female and male knew they were good at doing what they do. So this let us understand that even though females are not recognized as head of the household, they know they're very good at being entrepreneurs in the energy sector. Now, to try to summarize the results that we found, I'd like to share with you some of the words that the people we interviewed told us. Um, what we found is that businesses might be good sponsors for gender equality because their governance is it's made in such a way that even though a, a small group, so let's say the executive board of this company says, we want to reach gender equality, let's do it. Just do it. As this guy said, this is the CEO of the company that reached gender equality. If they want to do it, they have the power within the organization to reach gender equality. There is no barrier against that. About entrepreneurship is that we found that women, especially when catalyzing other women, they empower themselves and they build such a structure, an infrastructure, a network that help turning down those barriers that are against gender equality. When there is a social norm, such in East Africa, for example, against gender equality, when women decided that they don't want to be below men, they catalyze other women and they reach that. Now, there's not only businesses, there is not only entrepreneurs. What about us? What are a, a person like me who's gonna start working tomorrow, more or less, who's gonna start working tomorrow, what can I do in the company that I'm gonna work in? How each of you, what each of you can do every day to change this situation. I would like to share with you, closing this presentation, some numbers that represent the future we're running towards. And we all know that the future starts today, so we should start working today to change this future. So, since 2014, gender equality trends have not improved. Actually, the gender gap in 2017 had became worse for the first time in a decade. The global gender pay gap stands at 23%, so still women globally in average um, are paid 23% less. And women labor force participation rate is only 73% against the 94% for men. This summarizing the fact that gender parity will not be attained in the workplace before 
I'd like to hear some numbers here. Which year? 2,234. And for sure, I'm not going to be there then. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not even my, my sons and the sons of my son. So who's the responsibility for this? Who's responsible to change this situation? Well, as you can see in this picture and as you can see in this room, in our community, we have a great representation of women, even though our community is based mainly on STEM topics. Now, I know that there are also some companies represented in the audience, and I'm not one of the big four, but I'm telling you exactly the same for free. So I'd like to invite you to review your corporate social responsibility reports and try to understand if changing your internal policies can be beneficial not only to your profits, to your revenue, to your organizational performance, but to your people. Because that's what our company is based for, is businesses can be gender equality vectors is because of their people. Now, what individuals can do? That was the final question, right? What can I do? Well, as a young woman, I'm now aware of my role, not only in the society, but in the sustainable energy sector. And I'm not going to turn down my rights to work or to look for a company that will not treat me as if I were a man. However, at the same time, I know that I have to be the first catalyzer to make this change happen. And I'm going to work for the company that will let me do it exactly in the same way as a man would do, with the same rights, with the same duties, with the same opportunities. And I'm going to show every day, working as hard as I can, that those studies addressing gender diversity and gender equality in the energy sector is a super duper thing. They were right. I want to prove that every day. And this is what I think individuals can do to make gender equality possible. At the same time, <laughs> I'm not saying this because I worth it. It's because I think we all do in the same way. Thank you. Thank you.